What's going on, guys? This is Greg Ferris, founder of Myobrain, back here with another education video. This will be a little bit longer of an episode, but uh, definitely worth it. This is a topic that I've wanted to go over for a while and I think will help everyone that's in a fat loss phase or that will one day be in a fat loss phase really help you with your food selection, both when you are tracking and when you want to go to a more ad lib freestyle way of eating eventually. All right. So the topic today will be discussing energy density or food volume, kind of a similar concept. We have discussed this before with an episode a while back on the satiety index. To review that, the satiety index is pretty much a study in which they gave participants an equal amount of calories of different amounts of foods and then measured their hunger levels a few hours afterwards. So for example, we could give person A, 200 calories of grapes and then measure their hunger at intervals. Okay, we have that data and then give someone else 200 calories of apples, 200 calories of rice, et cetera, et cetera, on different days and then get a huge graph of, okay, when someone eats roughly this much food, here's how their hunger correlates with that. So you kind of can just essentially find less filling foods and more filling foods based upon that. This is essentially a part two version of that uh, based upon um, a, a different study that, that showed something really cool that we'll go over. Okay, so we'll go over what energy density food volume is, pretty basic, um, the study I wanted to share, and then also just some very practical takeaways of why this is important and how you can implement it. Okay, so um, I think this is a great way of looking at this very uh, simply up top here is that, uh, you know, Energy density is literally the energy or calories divided by the weight of the food. And you can see that pretty simply here with, say, the high energy density foods. So say say you, you know, weighed out, uh, very commonly people weigh out something like white rice. I'm not sure if that's on this list or not. But say, for example, you know, you weighed out, pretend white rice was in this high energy density food. You weighed out 100 grams of white rice how many calories are per gram, right? So if it was 100 calories per 100 grams, it would obviously be one, right? So what we're looking at here are these, the spectrum, just like the satiety index of very low energy density foods all the way up to high energy density foods. So again, for anyone that's weighed out um, things like this, like I'm a big fan of berries, uh, apples, you know that an apple can be very, very big, but be like 75 calories. And a huge component of these low energy dense foods is water, right? So a big component of that, that volume of food is not really like, um, you know, calorie dense is because it's water. Obviously water has no calories. And why that's really helpful for your satiety and to minimize hunger is because one of the biggest um, kind of signals your body has to your brain of how, kind of how much food you have is literally like the distension on your stomach. So if you're eating a lot of foods like this, you know, grapes, bananas, potatoes, apples that have a big water component in them, it literally kind of expands your stomach and sends a signal to your brain that you have food. And almost the opposite thing can happen when you're eating a lot of these type of foods, the higher energy dense foods. Some of these are no brainers, right? Like potato chips, um, other chips, ranch dressing, but other things, right? Like a granola bar, a lot of people wouldn't think is like terrible for you. Uh, pecans are on this list, but also would be on this list are things like almonds, peanuts, even like healthy fats. Um, there's no... You know, ranch dressing is here, but also something like olive oil, another healthy fat would be on here that's just super, super dense. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't have it. We're obviously, you're practicing flexible dieting. And that doesn't mean that it's bad, right? But that does mean, objectively speaking, it is going to be less filling than these foods on the left side of your screen with the green stars, right? So that's the, the biggest component of this, of looking at the, the water content of foods and then the correlation between the more water that's in foods, the more filling it's going to be because it distends your stomach. It literally takes up more space in your stomach, which is a signal to your brain that you don't need food. Even if you have a decent amount of calories, 
from something like this and you don't have that stomach distension because it's so dense, you do not get that same effect. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense as far as the spectrum of foods of literally, right. When, when this says 1.5 calories per gram, you know, that means that if you weighed out a hundred calories of that, it would be somewhere between, or sorry, a hundred grams of that food on the food scale. It'd be somewhere between 150 calories and 400 calories, right? So that's very, very simply what the energy density or food volume aspect is. Now, there are some cool graphics made by some other people here. I think this one is my kind of personal favorite uh, by at Daily Muscle. Uh, so what it does is what I kind of mentioned, it expresses the calorie content of these different foods per the same exact weight. All right. So 100 grams of broccoli again, is 34 calories. You look in the very extreme of that, 100 grams of granola, I don't know what that is, 20 times, 30 times the uh, the calorie intake of that, even for the same amount of weight of food, okay? And you see there's some middle ground here between, uh, you see a trend here, right? Fruits and vegetables tend to be the highest uh, volume or lowest energy dense foods, a lot of lot of volume for very minimal calories, proteins kind of in the middle, and then you have even some healthier ish. Um, uh, 100 grams of oats would be a lot of oats. So it's, some of this isn't really a practical, right? Because you would never eat that many oats, but still it puts it into context, right? Um, so really cool way to look at that here. Uh, this is pretty much uh, another way to look at it with just uh, a, a bigger scale as far as the density. So again, this would be. Um, lower calorie foods. This would be much, much higher calorie foods. So like I kind of mentioned, olive oil is on this list. Obviously, butter's on this list. Sorry for anyone that's still doing Bulletproof Coffee. Um, peanuts are on this list. Again, not bad. Just understand they don't have the same effect on your appetite as something like a carrot or an apple or chicken breast would. Okay. So again, you, you can look at this too and I'll see the magnitude of that, right? Where it's like, look at chicken breast versus peanuts and then peanuts, you know, chicken breast would actually be six times as filling as a peanut would, right? This generally falls in line with our, our macronutrient concepts too, of wanting a lower fat, moderate carb, high protein diet, also making sure those moderate carbs come from a lot of fiber. Okay. So I think those are the two best uh, graphics on this presentation that I saw. Again, I really, really like this one. Uh, this is very, very similar as far as the, uh, you know, per a hundred grams you weighted out essentially what percentage of that food would be caloric, right? So obviously you see something like this, uh, vegetable here, very small portion of that would be, um, you know, caloric. And then some of these even higher ones over here could actually get up to, there's more calories than grams, right? So it means like, you know, two or three or four uh, calories per just one gram of food, which is very, very dense, right? So that's essentially what it is. Uh, going back to my other Word document here, um, let's actually uh, go over the study really quick. So this was a really cool study and why it kind of uh, caught my eye to share this with you, with you guys, right? So I'll kind of just briefly go over this and why it was important. So they took a pretty small sample size, but it's, it's, falls in line with other things that we know. So 18 uh, women, and they were given free access uh, to three different types of foods, right? So there was a low uh, energy dense group, medium energy dense group, and high energy dense group, right? So essentially thinking about this green group as a group, yellow is a different group, and red is a different group. There's a bigger variety of foods, right? But that's essentially what you can think of as the three groups, right? What the cool part of this was, they were not really told to eat a certain way. They were essentially just given access to those groups of foods that they were in, either low, moderate, or high. And then they measured the volume of food that they ate and also the corresponding calories of that. Okay. Um, also the pal palatability of foods. So, right, if something was crunchy or something was savory, was also standardized between groups since we generally know that that, that can also affect how much you eat something. If, it, if something has a really good crunch to it, um, you tend to want to eat more of those foods. So that was something else that was standardized across each group. Okay. 
So this is an important line here. So it said, results showed that subjects consumed a similar amount of food by weight across the three conditions of energy density. Okay. So again, that literally means that I'm just using this as an example. All the participants roughly maybe consumed two pounds of food throughout the day in weight, but obviously two pounds of a lot of these foods may only be 1500 calories, while two pounds of those foods may be 3000 calories, right? But it was shown that regardless of the foods these people were choosing, they were roughly eating, I'm making this up, but about two pounds, right? That the weight was same across the group. So that means the food density of each of those is what caused the actual difference in calorie intake. So what we actually saw here was, again, the high energy dense group was about 1800 calories. The median sorry, medium was about 1500. And then the low was a, was high 1300s, let's call that 1400. So there's about a 400 calorie difference. Again, these people were not encouraged to eat certain portions or to eat well, or they were just literally given this food about a 425 calorie difference on average between the high energy density group and the low energy density group. And again, if you've been working with us for a while, you just understand kind of a caloric deficit, 400 calories is like about the difference between someone losing weight and not losing weight, right? I mean, that's even actually a, a pretty big calorie deficit. So say that 1800 calorie individual could be maintaining their weight or maybe even gaining a tiny bit of weight over time, while the group in the 1400 calorie group could actually be losing maybe a pound a week. That's a pretty significant difference between those two groups, right? And then lastly here, the researchers uh, summarized with, there were no differences in hunger or fullness before meals, after meals, or over a two-day across conditions. The results, the results from this study indicate that energy density affects energy in, in, intake independent of macronutrient content or palatability, suggesting that the overconsumption of high fat foods may be due to their energy density rather than just to the fat content. Okay, so again, the hunger aspect here is also very important that even though one group consumed 425 calories less than another group, they were not significantly more hungry than that group, right? So that's the study we're going over. And to put this really succinctly, and that's what I have here on this bullet point, judging from this study and also judging from other things that we've seen, purely by manipulating high food volume based diets, people almost inherently create their own calorie deficit. I want to reiterate, these people were not aiming to lose weight. Their weight wasn't even measured. But obviously, you know, if a group of people is consuming 400 calories less than someone else, they're going to lose more weight over time. So again, there was no prompt here, unlike yourself, where like if you signed up with us, or if you're trying to um, improve your diet, you're consciously trying to do that. So either it's probably even a bigger benefit to that as opposed to just really an ad limited uh, perspective for people, right? So only thing they manipulated was the density of foods and they saw that 400 calorie difference, right? Uh, the simple way I think for you guys to go about monitoring this is the fiber intake. It's, it's damn near impossible to, to kind of research which foods are higher or lower in water than other ones, but there's a pretty good correlation, not exactly, but a pretty good correlation between the fiber content of foods and also the water content and also just lower energy density of those, right? And again, I don't want you splitting hairs here in the big term of say, okay, well, broccoli has 13 less calories per 100 gram than oranges. Therefore, I'm not going to have orange, just going to have strawberries or the same thing with oranges and bananas. What you should look at almost like, you know, you're, you're cutting this, this long list in half here. Anything on this left side tends to be pretty good. This yellow is like still pretty good. We get out to the orange is like, okay, oranges, I need to be really cautious of. And then red stuff, I need to be very, very cautious of. I think they actually, they don't mention that here, but I think there was something else where I saw they literally put that where it's like, eat as much as you want. Uh, be mindful. Oh, it is right here. Sorry. <laughs> Load up on uh, start monitoring portion size of. So again, they're kind of saying like these things, it's 
damn near impossible to overeat. These things, start thinking about it. These things, you need to be conscious of your portion size. And these things are very, very hard to monitor on, on the far, far right for you guys, okay? So um, I think fiber intake is the simplest way to, to honor that because it's going to give you something quantitative to look at. Um, so again, we recommend, generally speaking, like 20 to 25 grams of fiber minimum for women and then probably somewhere around 30 uh, for men. Uh, there is some wiggle room there depending upon you know how much overall food you're eating. But I would say 20 for women and 30 for men is a really good like uh, starting place for people. And then as you get leaner and leaner, you want to make sure that your fiber intake is staying high or maybe even getting higher over time. Um, so even to say if a smaller female is only on 150 carbs per day, she may need 30 grams a fiber to really ensure they get a lot of water content, low energy density foods to stay full. Okay. So again, I would recommend, I, I try to be like a harp on this with clients a lot, but I think, you know, macros get so pervasive in people's head of like, that's all that matters. Fat, carb, protein, macros, 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 that they forget that yes, that, that you know, macros and more correctly, your calorie intake is driving your your actual weight loss, but there's a lot of factors that can prevent you from consistently doing that. And if you're selecting, even if you're hitting your macros, hitting your calorie intake, but you're selecting a lot of high energy density foods, you more than likely will be hungrier than you should be, which is probably a ticking time bomb when you're going to fall off of your diet. Okay. Uh, one other thing that was brought up, uh, this was in a separate study, but it's also pertinent to this, this third bullet here. So they were shown that, um, giving people the prompt in the same realm that they would like to eat more fruits and vegetables, which again is a simple way of just saying low energy density foods, right. Is more successful than telling people to not eat the say the red foods, the high energy density foods. And it's the same exact thing, right? But what we're seeing is there's a mindset shift there, much like with flexible dieting. When you're told, when I whenever I consult with somebody, I don't want to tell them, don't eat this, don't eat this, don't eat this, don't eat this. It's like, okay, what the hell should I eat? Right. And it, it sets a mindset for you of, of restriction, which obviously you have to restrict something to lose weight, right? But your whole you're fixated on what you can't have, right? As opposed to if you just tell someone to eat more fruits and vegetables, if they're doing that, like the study showed, they will tend to displace a lot of those high energy density foods. So they're still inevitably eating less of those things, but their mindset is focused more upon what they are eating. So again, that, that goes into your adherence of what you're doing, okay? So that's the third point. And then I had one um, final graphic that I wanted just to show that I think can help people as well as far as uh, understanding this, right? So again, this would essentially be the, the two different comparisons, say if you had breakfast, lunch, and dinner, really simply, right? So the low energy density plates would be something like this. You know, these are all fruits and vegetables or a protein. The high energy density plates could be high fat foods, high sugar foods, things like that. So granola bar, bacon, peanuts, burger, cheese, beer, that could be a soda as well, chocolate bar, candy, uh, things like that. I don't, potato chips, fries, high, high energy density foods. So Again, pretend you had this, the three plates the same exact size and they both have the same amount of food on them. One group of people may eat, this is 3,000 calories throughout the day. Another group of people would only eat, if you do the math, 2,100 calories per day. Just like we saw in that study, the hunger levels would be the exact same, right? And there would be a 900 calorie difference between these two groups of people, right? So this is just very, very important for people that – even are tracking their food because again, the, the less hungry you can be. Um, and also generally when you're less hungry or they're less likely to have cravings for, for high energy dense stuff um, in a weird paradoxical way, it's like eating high energy dense stuff almost makes you want more of it because it doesn't fill you up as much as you think it would. Uh, so that's another good representation I think as well of thinking of Literally, you had three plates of the exact same size, but by selecting different choices, you're not actually eating. When I say this, you're not actually eating less food. When you think of how much food you're putting into your mouth, <laughs> you're just eating less calories of those foods. 
Okay. And then to wrap this up, uh, so why this actually matters, right? I mentioned food selection during dieting phases, right? So again, the less hungry you can be, the less cravings you're going to have, either it's going to help you be sustain it. Um, your, your adherence success rate is going to be higher more than likely. Or even if you're like, it doesn't matter how hungry you are, you're going to stick to your diet. You're just going to have a more enjoyable time, right? I think everyone would say if you could lose 20 pounds, but doing one group of decisions, you were hungry all the time. And one, you were rarely hungry, you would pick the rarely hungry group, right? So even if you are going to follow things to a T no matter what, still picking mostly low energy dense foods will have you just enjoy the process much, much better. Okay. And then probably the more important aspect of this would be people who are in non-tracking phases, whether that's they've successfully lost the weight they wanted to lose. Maybe they tracked a little bit to make sure they can maintain that. And now they want to transition into just good, good habits without having to be so tied to tracking, which is not for everyone all the time. I think that's became very much like the the goal for people before they've actually reached the point of success, right? If your goal is to lose 30 pounds and you lost five pounds, you're probably not ready for intuitive eating just yet, right? But hopefully you can get to that point if you do have a major body composition change, right? So when people do get there, or I'm making this video in mid-November, say you're traveling to you know internationally, or you are um, going back home for a few weeks, and you kind of just, you have goals, and you just don't want to be so stressed out about tracking your food, following this sort of plan of just generally p picking low energy dense foods more often than not will help you a ton with controlling that intake. Just like we saw in that study, the group of people were not trying to lose weight. They weren't trying to be health conscious. That's just the food that was around them. They ate the food that was around them until they were full. And lo and behold, they ate 400 calories than the other group that was eating the food around them that was higher in, 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 in uh, energy density, right? So even more importantly, during those situations, that's what you want to think of. So, you know, during Thanksgiving and, and Christmas and all the winter holidays, right? The less you can be surrounded by those high energy density foods, whether in your house or your office or things like that. And more importantly, what I would say is just like on this mindset front, having access and filling up your diet with more fruits and vegetables will inherently make you want those other high energy dense foods less, right? So that would mean like if you typically don't pack snacks at work, now you can pack, you know, fruits and vegetables uh, for work, knowing there's going to be some like just crap all throughout your office. Now that you actually are eating like some carrots for a snack at 10 a.m., you'll be much, much less likely to go have some cake in the break room, right? So that's why it matters. Obviously it matters for people who are tracking still to stick to their diet adherence. It matters even more people who aren't tracking their food because it's unconsciously a really, really good way to control your calorie intake. If you're at least trying to maintain your weight during a little break from tracking, or like I said, if you've successfully had a very big body composition change and you're looking to be more habit-based than just uh, tracking your macros, okay? So uh, that is it, guys. Hopefully you liked the video. Again, this was discussing energy density and food volume. Again, a little bit of a longer one, but hopefully you got some value from this. If you guys have any follow-up questions, uh, something didn't make sense, you always can email me directly at myobraincoaching at gmail.com. And that is it. Thanks, guys.